Welcome to In Isolation. I'm James Kerwin, webcasting from Los Angeles, California. And with me, as always, all the way from Surrey Hills, England, is the lovely and talented Nicola Bryant. Hello, Earthlings. <laughs> How are we this week? How are you? I am uh, once again find myself very much looking forward to this episode. How about you? Me too. I'm very excited. Very, very excited. Really looking forward to this. This week, we have as our special guest, now that we're doing special guests, Mr. Robert J. Sawyer, who is one of the most prominent science fiction authors in the world today. Yeah. I am not going to begin to try to go into a list of his accolades and awards and his repertoire here. It would take the entire show just to name them all off. So what I will do is I encourage everybody to please go to sfwriter.com, which is Rob's website, and read all about him, everything he's done, the history of his works. Um, he has written dozens of novels, uh, some of the highlights, Calculating God, Terminal Experiment, one of my personal favorites, Mind Scan, Flash Forward, The Wake Watch Wonder Trilogy, uh, Red Planet Blues, uh, Quantum Night, and and uh, he's got a new book coming out. So we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, he, 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 Rob and I both share a kind of a preoccupation with the concept of human consciousness. What makes us conscious? How does that work? What is the mechanism of consciousness? Uh, in fact, both he and I have spoken at the University of Arizona's Science of Consciousness Conference twice now. And I, I couldn't be more thrilled to have him on. Ah, just before we bring Rob on. Could I just make a little announcement? Oh, please, yes. What's up? I am trying my best to make some money for two of my main charities, which is Dots, Dogs on the Streets. Um, they take care of the homeless and the homeless dogs. Um, please look them up. They do fantastic work. And Chimney Farm Rescue who also do some fantastic work and uh, I have helped raise money for them before. So I am doing something a little special for all the fans and for everyone who's feeling a little bit stressed out, feeling they could do with a dose of wellness, um, a little feeling of abundance in a time which might feel a little pinched. So I am doing something I call quantum hypnosis, which is a very uh, deep and uh, excellent way of working with the subconscious and wow. it should be very restful and very peaceful and don't worry i am a qualified clinical hypnotherapist not just an actor uh i will be doing this uh about an hour of relaxation and uh, deep work so that you can all feel fabulous on june the 18th so please join us tickets are uh, available uh, via my website there'll be a little link Please, I look forward to seeing you then. That is amazing. That is so cool. And, and the money's going to a good cause, so you can't ask for anything more than that. Wonderful. Thank you. So please let us bring on Rob. All right. Well, without further ado, here is the man himself, Robert J. Sawyer. Rob, how are you doing? I'm fine, James. Hi, Nicola. How are you guys? We're great. Good to see you. Oh, so nice to see you guys. England, Canada, the United States. We're all over the world. We got three different time zones here. This is wonderful. Not quite the United Federation of Planets, but it's a start, right? <laughs> <laughs> how, is, uh, how is isolation treating you? Are you uh, going stir crazy yet? So I'm not, you know, because I'm a full-time self-employed freelance writer. And I have been for almost 40 years now, 38 years I've been doing this, working out of my home, right? And so it is different but it is not as different as it is for a lot of people. And, you know, it's funny, prior to this, Carolyn and I have been talking about, we don't need this big place we've got. We've got a pretty big place. We should downsize. And I said to her yesterday, ain't no way we're downsizing, woman. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have some elbow room if you're going to be locked in for weeks on end. So I'm doing okay. You know, I'm, uh, this is the chair I, I sit in and I write in. This is my, I've got, you can't see it, of course, but there are three computer monitors right here. And uh, this is where I sit and do my work. It's not that much different, except 
you know, I do, uh, obviously, as you know this, James, because you've directed a, a script that I wrote and Nicholas starred in it for Star Trek Continues. You know, I do some work in film and television. That used to mean having to go into downtown Toronto, which is about an hour's trip from where I live in the suburbs, for pointless meetings. And now I don't have to do it. <laughs> I have an excuse. I can do a phone call, I can do a Zoom, but I don't have to go to the bloody meetings. And that's actually a plus in my book. Yeah, there are some upsides to isolation and definitely the pointless meetings have ended. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. There, you know, and, and I don't want to, like, today, the day we're talking, not the day this drops, is the day that the New York Times filled its entire front page, Memorial Day weekend. We're not with the dead from a war, but the dead from COVID-19. So I don't want to minimize, none of us want to minimize yeah. the disaster this has been for families. I just uh, saw a friend of mine uh, posted her mother had died, his mother had died, excuse me, yesterday. Alone, I mean, in a hospital, but alone, family couldn't visit. I mean, you know, I don't mean to be glib at all when I say, eh, no biggie for me. I'm lucky, privileged, and I know that. I think it's been very hard for some people. I'm, I'm not a full-time writer, but I am mostly work from home. I do, I do write from home. I do work from home. Um, and it has stopped the five auditions for a role that's two lines. Um, and and all of that nature um and most of my work had been very locally based and a lot of voice work um so i'm used to i'm quite good with my own company so i think it's been a lot easier for me and and i appreciate how how lucky i am to have that situation and dogs and my mother see you know there's a difference between you and me who live in a climate that isn't always clement and James, who lives in paradise in Los Angeles, you and I are used to there being weeks, if not months out of the year, that we don't go out much anyways. Yeah. We can avoid it because in Toronto, it's snow on the ground. It's, it's below zero Celsius, below 32 Fahrenheit temperatures. James, on the other hand, in his Bermuda shorts and his Hawaiian shirt, is out there cavorting amongst the palm trees all year long. It's true. Are you not? <laughs> He's got his Bermuda shorts on now. <laughs> well, at least he has shorts. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're... <laughs> Don't make assumptions, Nicola. I'm sorry. I was trying to cover you, so to speak. Exactly. We can get two weeks of horrendous rain, and it's trying to get the dogs to just run to the end of the road and back, or just even go outside with a giant golfing umbrella. So we're used to huddling in, putting the fire on, and just staying at home. So exactly. And in fact, this is my workspace right there, that line of sight. That's my fireplace, my wood-burning fireplace. Very Canadian, very, you know, in a climate that we have these things called seasons that James is blissfully ignorant of down there in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> they have lovely and more lovely. <laughs> <laughs> So, Rob, you are not only one of the world's most prominent science fiction authors, you are one of very, very few who have won both the Hugo Award, the Nebula Award, and the Campbell Award. Um, can you tell us a little about your background, specifically what ultimately led you to decide to go into this particular field? Because it's a difficult field. You're absolutely right. Now, I wish I could say for Nicola's benefit, that it was Doctor Who. But we didn't start getting Doctor Who, even though it was created by a Canadian, as you know. We didn't start getting it in Toronto until I was a teenager. But we did get Jerry Anderson. There's Thunderbird 2 right there. And Jerry Anderson's Super Marionation Science Fiction Puppet Productions, uh, I first discovered them in first run. Right? I was born in 1960. So with Supercar, and then um, Fireball XL5 uh, was really what hooked me. It was an outer space adventure show for kids. And then let's see if we can tip up a little bit. And I also grew up when Star Trek was in first run on TV. Um, so I am the first generation of my field of prose print science fiction writers to come into the field, not through the reading of books or pulp magazines, but through film and TV. Now, once uh, my dad realized when I was, you know, 10 years old that I was devouring science fiction, such little that there was on TV, then 
he went to a bookstore and actually, I guess it was when I was 12, he went to our local bookstore and he found me two science fiction books. One of them was written by Isaac Asimov. Well, he knew that name from Asimov's nonfiction. The other was written by David Gerald, his first novel, Space Skimmer. My dad didn't know David, who, you know, who did at that time. Now, it was world famous, but he knew Star Trek. So, okay, here are the two books that my son will start reading. And that got me hooked for life, hooked for life on reading it. And then, you know, as many of us do, whether you're an actor, a director, a writer, or hyphenates, as we all are, um, you say, man, these other people are having such fun doing it. I want to try myself. And that's how it happened. That's brilliant. That's so exciting. I'm the same, uh, born the same year as you. So I have those same uh, sphere reference, sphere of reference, because I, I was first drawn into uh, my love of science fiction through the television. Have you had your birthday yet this year? Uh, not yet, no. Oh, you, I, I have no time for you youngsters. <laughs> yeah, us youngsters. That's right. <laughs> We're, we're very excited. I'm particularly excited about your next book that's coming out, The Oppenheimer Alternative, June 2nd. Um, and it's been four years since your last novel, I believe. Which is crazy. While we were setting up to do this interview, you and I were talking about the gaps that come between engagements. Whenever you're any kind of freelancer, I'm a freelance novelist. And four years ago, actually, I was kind of saying, I'm done. I, I Quantum Night, my most my penultimate book. I'm done. I'm finished. And then I, a friend said, you got to read up on Leo Zillard. There's a play about him coming to the Montreal Fringe Festival. And I started reading about this guy. Now, he's not a household name like J. Robert Oppenheimer or Albert Einstein or Edward Teller or Hans Bethe, the other guys who were involved with the Manhattan Project. But he was the guy who first conceived of the nuclear chain reaction that gives rise to uh, nuclear fission and that that might present a bomb uh, possibility. He's the guy who wrote the letter that Einstein signed that went to President Roosevelt that got the United States to do what you and I, as Commonwealth citizens, Nicola, can recognize, to do what the Americans were not doing in World War II, which is being proactive, right? The Tube Alloys Project in the United Kingdom was well underway before the United States got involved in building an atomic bomb. And Canada and the United Kingdom, of course, were participants in the war well before the United States. But nonetheless, I read about Leo Zillard, and that led me to Oppenheimer, the Manhattan Project. And there's a great Canadian literature professor, Northrop Fry, who um, says, ultimately, all good fiction is about redemption. And every one of the major characters involved with the Manhattan Project, except for two, the military man, General Groves, and Edward R. Teller, who is usually taken as the model for Dr. Strangelove in the Stanley Kubrick film, came to regret, and in many cases even repent, their involvement in creating this weapon. And my mantra has long been, the world would be a much better place if the brightest people in the world would not make the things the stupidest people in the world asked them to make. Hitler wanted an atomic bomb, but he couldn't make it on his own, right? China and Japan and Russia, everybody wanted this damn thing. But it was the scientists who said, oh, wow, you're saying unlimited funds? I get to do whatever science I want, and I get to offload the morality of it onto somebody else? Count me in. Well, that's the template for so many of our current crises, and it just seems such a timely book to write, even though it's set in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And is it set as an alternative scenario, an alternative history? Um, so I like the term secret history. Uh, because yeah. every event that's cataloged in the book, every uh, signpost event in Oppenheimer's life, is exactly, if I portray it, it's exactly as it really happened, as well as we can determine from the sometimes scanty historical record. Mm. But there were all kinds of gaps in that area, and there were two that caught me immediately. The first was, everybody knows, Oppenheimer uh, was the scientific head of the most secret scientific project in human history. Tube alloys from Britain was folded into it. Canada, 
was folded into it. The three allied powers that developed the atomic bomb, Canada, the United States, and Great Britain, all under the scientific direction of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Not even the vice president, Truman, knew that there was this uh, uh, undertaking going on until FDR died, and then he was briefed after he was sworn in. That's how secret it was. And Oppenheimer lost his security clearance after the war. Unbelievable. The man who had, you know, as, as I, I. Ravi said, what more do you want from this guy? Mermaids? He gave you everything you asked for. And you've, you, you treat him like this. But um, when you have so, a situation like that, of course, there's press interest. And Oppie said to a journalist, if a journalist were to dig deep enough, you would find that this is a much deeper story than just my security suspension. That's one. Two, much more briefly, Oppenheimer was an astrophysicist before the war, not a nuclear physicist. And he was the first person ever to postulate the existence of black holes. After the war, Freeman Dyson, the great Freeman Dyson of, uh, of Dyson Sphere fame, who just died earlier this year, asked Oppenheimer repeatedly, you know, that work you did on black holes, that was amazing. How come you never went back to it? And Oppie would immediately give him the talk to the hand and change the subject. So what cosmological secret was there in the background of Oppenheimer's being ruined publicly by a security hearing? I tried to write a novel that filled in those gaps without contradicting a single fact that we know to be true. And that's what the Oppenheimer alternative is. That's so exciting. That is just my kind of book. I love that sort of, but you, you, I love your work because you philosophize, because you look for the, the conscious reasons and the decisions that people have made and their consequences. Um, so I cannot recommend highly enough. Get your books now before it's out, June 2nd. That's right. It's on pre-order discount now, as a matter of fact. I have my, um, my pre-order discount. <laughs> yes, good. I appreciate that. And, you know, all three of us here are most famous for our work in the science fiction field. James has got poster of the great Yesterday Was a Lie, his science fiction film noir movie that he wrote and directed behind him there. Um, but I actually don't like the term science fiction. I like the term philosophical fiction, the fiction of big ideas. So instead of sci-fi, it would be fi-fi. And I think it's much more, much less off-putting to the general public, to the reading public who says, I, I don't like that Star Wars escape. It doesn't do anything. Just, no, no. We want to talk about why we're here, where we're going. Is there God? What's the meaning of life? What are the moral ramifications of the technology that's remaking our whole society? That's what this literature is about. I love that term. I'm, I'm so going to be a fi-fi female from now on. <laughs> Very good. Speaking of uh, philosophical fiction and tackling um, those type of subjects, one of the books that you've written in the past that, that tackles some, some very heavy subjects was Flash Forward. And uh, as, as most people know, the uh, ABC television series was based on this novel. Now, you were also involved in the writing of the series. So can you tell us a little bit about that transition, like the fundamental difference in the process of writing a novel versus writing a script? The single biggest thing and why most novelists will never make it in Hollywood, uh, is they think the job of Hollywood is to take $100 million, which is what we spent making the, the, the Flash Forward series. 12 on the pilot, 21 episodes. After that, at $4 million apiece, $100 million bucks. To, with great fidelity and absolute adherence to my vision, put it on the screen. No, no. They don't give a damn what my vision was they want my central core conceit and are willing to pay Hollywood style coin to acquire it. But you have to go in there with zero ego. And as I said to David Goyer, who was our showrunner, the great David S. Goyer from Batman Begins, he's now on Krypton, he's adapting Asimov's Foundation trilogy right now. Uh, I said to David Goyer, the first day I showed up in the writer's room, Dave, I will never say to you, that's not the way it was in my novel but I'll be all over your ass if you contradict in episode eight what you did in episode four. And on that basis, 
we got along just fine. But you got to check the ego at the door. You got to say, this is the nicest thing I think anybody ever said to me was my last day in the writer's room at Flash Forward. The receptionist of the Flash Forward office on the Disney lot there in Los Angeles, where you are, said to me, I just want to say to you, Mr. Sawyer, before you go, thank you for creating something that gave all of us jobs. We had 140 odd people working on the TV production. Oh my God, you know, that's the greatest accolade. Whether it's an accurate portrayal of anything I did is entirely secondary at that point. That said, I love the show Flash Forward. I think we had an absolutely magnificent cast. The other writers were spectacular and they carried much more of the water than I did for writing the show. Uh, one of the peak experiences of my life. But just, but just even the writing process itself, like as you approach writing a novel versus uh, how you approach writing a teleplay, like that's a very different process. Absolutely. The whole joy of writing the Oppenheimer alternative and making Oppie, of all the colorful, larger-than-life characters I could have chosen, the main character, was he was the only one of the principal players who never wrote an autobiography. Nobody, nowhere did he ever set down what he was thinking at the time he did, and in some cases did horribly self-destructive or damaging things. What the hell was this guy thinking? To be able to write the inner monologue, or sometimes it's a dialogue. Maybe I should do this. No, Oppie, think for a second before you act. Don't do that. To be able to write the interior life of a character, that's the whole point of being a novelist. But as soon as you're writing a script, you can't say, Oppie pauses for a second, considers whether or not he should tell his wife, Kitty, that he has a mistress that he left behind without saying goodbye, who has just killed herself, quite possibly, because of Oppie's neglect in uh, giving her a proper farewell before he went off to the super secret. You can't do that. All you can do at the best is say, Oppie pauses two words in the script and leave it to the actor and the director to find the way to externalize whatever internal conflict isn't actually on the page. Yeah. So it's writing the internal life as a novelist versus writing the external life as a screenwriter.